All right, I'm gonna bead this uh, face frame now. Now, um, sometimes I do the uh, notching first, but sometimes I'll do the beading first. The reason I'm doing the beading first is because I already had this set up in the machine because I did a previous job and I haven't actually taken this out because I knew I was gonna be doing this. So um, hopefully it won't tear out when I make the notches, but um, we'll see. And woods that are prone to chipping out, um, when I make uh, beads, what I like to do is make a scoring pass. Um, so it's, it's kind of like one of those things where it may not chip out, but a lot of times it does. Take that tooth and put it so it just barely cuts into the wood. Yeah. It's, it's such a light cut. You want to make sure you have good even downward pressure. Um, as you're doing it. So that's basically what I when I'm talking about scoring it. So you can see how shallow a cut that is. But what it does is it just slices the wood fibers and now I know this piece is not going to have chip out. Rather than having it be rounded like traditional, if you want to do a square bead, you just leave it just like this and you'll end up with a little piece. Now, of course, you can make it deeper, but um, that's essentially what it is without getting in that roundover part. Okay, well, that's it right there. Perfect bead with absolutely crisp edge. Try that method uh, versus cutting it all in one pass. Just takes a little bit of effort to do it this way, but you get absolutely perfect results. Let me go ahead and I'll um, switch this out for the, the uh, notching cutter and cut the notches. This is the notching cutter and I'm gonna use this setup gauge, uh, I'm using the uh, quarter inch uh, beading bit. So this needs to be raised up exactly one quarter inch. Best way to do that is to just take this and bring it across until you feel like you can um, pass over it without it binding on the aluminum of the gauge. And then when that happens, lock it in. And once it's locked in, go over it again and see if you can still do it. The problem with a lot of routers is that when you lock routers in, they tend to shift a little bit. They tend to go up. Now, mine is no different. It goes up just ever so slightly, but it does go up. And that means that you got to account for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a test cut on this with the scrap piece and just make sure that that's the right height. Since I already have my bead here on a scrap piece, I can just take it and I can just run that guy across there. And if this piece ends up with a nice flush cut like this, that notch goes right in there and there's no lip or anything. It's a perfectly cut piece. So that's what I'm looking for. To get this in the right spot, I actually have these marks that I cut into my track there on both sides. And um, so I used to do these all the time, beaded face frames. And because of that, I got um, this jig. Um, this jig is a lot easier to use than the typical way I used to do it, which is the old school way with the table saw and, you know, beveling and all that stuff. But trust me, this is a definitely a nicer approach to doing it. The only thing is that it requires, um, you know, setup. You know, you got to figure out, you got to be able to be consistent with it. And that's one of those things that's kind of a trick is to be able to get consistent result. You got to make sure that they're at the right height. So if you aren't pushing down tightly to the table or if your piece has a warp to it, you know, if it's curved, 
it all it makes it almost next to impossible to do a beaded face frame if you have curved pieces it just doesn't work so you got to work with straight pieces so i can make a test cut i might as well make it the height i need that way i can at least you know get that good so i'll do that too Okay, so that last cut did the notch for the miters. So this is essentially the bottom pieces and the top pieces get mitered right there. And then this part goes into the notch created by the notching cutter. Like I said, normally I don't do the bead first. Uh, there's reasons for that, one of which is tear out. So when you do beads first, um, you're going to have to clean up a little it's not necessarily tear out. It can be though, but mo more it's just like the burr of the wood. The um, wood just kind of comes over and it just, you know, makes a bit of a mess. Um, this is what I'm talking about, that little burr right there. So basically what you just have to do is just go through there and then um, clean that up. But you see the difference. Um, these guys are really, really clean, both sides. Those were cut with the bead cutting after the notching. So if you're doing this, do it the other way. Um, I just happen to have the bead already set up. It's really nice to be able to have this light up here. And this is just one of my uh, magnetic Bosch lights. Just goes right there. But you can see as I'm going down here, I, I have really good vision. These are my lines. They're pretty, they're pretty much like a, a guide. They're not gonna be exact. That's why I do test pieces. Every one I did a test piece on. I think the hardest part about doing these is getting the setups right, making sure you have straight pieces. Um, if your boards are warped, if there's any curvature to them, it's really hard. I mean, if you've got bows in your pieces, it really makes it difficult. What I find is that sometimes you'll get um, deviations in this part here. So your notches will be a little bit different you know, as you do them. Ultimately, what I found is that if I go through and just carefully do it again, I smooth it out. So you may end up with little ridges. Um, you can kind of see them, but they're, they're just so microscopic. But you can see here, that's what I'm gonna have to clean up right there. That's the, the bead right there that's uh, kind of messed up from the, the burr there. But this is the other side, so that's the clean side. All right, now the top and bottom pieces, the rails, I'm going to put um, pockets in those. So um, the ones with the miters, those guys, those are going to get pockets. I'll do three of them. That's it. I'll, I'll do these pockets and then put this together. All right, when I put this together, I have to be really careful that the pieces don't shift. I find that the inch and a quarter screws cause the pieces to shift a little more than what I like. Um, so I like to use inch screws. Now this is going to be a stain job. Uh, actually, this is, I'm not going to use this regular glue. All right, this stuff is great, but it's 
I think my bottle's just, yeah. I think I need to go grab a new bottle. Okay, I'm really excited because I was able to find my favorite glue uh, for stain grade projects. This is it. If you do stain grade jobs, you'll know how difficult it is to get glue residue off of your wood. And sometimes you just can't help having glue squeeze out. So if you use this wood glue, trust me, it is amazing for stain grade jobs. Now, different than uh, normal face frames, I can actually glue the um, styles. Normally you would actually put glue on the ends of the rails. These are always a challenge when you glue these up. Um, there's a couple things challenging about them. One is you're, you're always one wanting to um, get the, the joints flush. Height-wise, everything you know needs to be really good, but it's sometimes hard to do. And sometimes when you drive the screws, they shift. The pieces shift. So what I found is using one inch screws helps a lot with the shifting on pocket screw joining. So this is regular wood glue. This would be a real problem. All these areas that have squeeze out, it would be not good. Now one thing about this glue is the um, the consistency of it is really cool. It doesn't um, drip like normal glue does. See how it kind of sticks? It clings more. Now obviously it's going to drip at some point, but it doesn't have the same characteristics as like a normal tight bond glue, um, which is really cool. If you're using it in areas that are like uh, vertical surfaces that are, you know, you don't, you don't want it to fall down. Okay, I'm just gonna let this stuff cook overnight. Even though this is the back side, I still want this to be perfectly flush. So I'm gonna sand everything. Also, when the finishers stain, I want this to be nice and clean as well. So I'm gonna sand this just the same as I'm gonna sand the front. So I'm gonna start with 100 grit with my um, five millimeter orbit sander. This is my six inch. And then I'm gonna go to a um, five inch sander after i level out the surface i'm going to go to a five inch sander and utilize um, 150 180 and just top out at 220. so obviously i'm going to do the the back first because then when i move it around it's not, i don't have to worry about the front getting scratched this will take a little while up real nicely now what i need to do is Think about the, um, the joints here at the top and bottom. So what I can do is since I have a joiner, I'm gonna take a light pass at the very beginning and I'm gonna start right here, run that through, and then turn the piece over and do it from the other side so that I don't have tear out on this side. <laughs> Any tear out that might be there as you can see there's not much but if there is any tear out now's the time to clean it up on this pass with the grain smooth out that little interior area because what what ultimately happens is when you wipe it with a damp cloth it just raises the grain a little bit you go over this entire area here just lightly this is pretty fine sandpaper this isn't very aggressive I think it's a, uh, oh, this is the great stuff that doesn't say what it is. Um, I think it's 180, I think. So now if you're doing a whole kitchen and you're doing um, beaded face frame, you know, that's a significant amount of work to do. This is why I charge so much to do a beaded face frame cabinets, um, especially when they're large quantity cabinets. But 
um, this little bit here isn't so bad, but you, you could see, just kind of figure out for yourself how long it takes to do an entire kitchen uh, full of these cabinets or a big job. You know, it takes quite a bit of time. And this is just fine tuning it. This stands out, the job um, makes it so much better. Whether it's painted or whether it's stained, it looks really good. So now we'll do the same thing for the other ones. Some don't need it, but some do. You see how that there's a different elevation of the bead? That's what I'm talking about. So that part there needs to be just slightly lowered. So if you use sandpaper, you just need to be real careful. But the other way to do it would be, let's see if I can do this with a, do this with one hand. With your sharp chisel, just start out here and just kind of slightly blend it. You're just going to take a little bit off. Not much. And you're just going to go around and just kind of work that around so that there's not a flat spot or anything. And now when you do this, you're going to end up with ultimately a, a flush uh, piece there. Now let's see what that looks like. All right, so that you can see just by doing that right there, took that down. So now we have a flush bead. The only thing left to do on this would be to blend this area that I just chiseled right here and make it round. It's not much, but take this guy and just kind of lightly blend it in. And that's going to get rid of that little tiny flat spot. Now remember, since this is stained, you have to think about um, sanding direction, right? Whenever you do use sandpaper on a stain grade project, you have to think about sanding swirl marks, you know, all sorts of stuff that you don't have to worry about with paint grade. That looks very good right there. Perfect. And that joint is nice. The top joint is beautiful. So very nice.